We would also like to thank our sponsors. Without all the sponsors, this would not have been possible. Our title sponsor, State Bank of India. And we are co-powered and sponsored by NABAR. And this summit is in association with National Commodity and Derivatives Exchange Limited and Interfill Industries Limited. Our associate sponsor, Manuka Agritech Limited and Privo Agri Business Limited. Our regional sponsor, National Stock Exchange and Vagut, Mehta National Institute of Cooperative Management and our telecoms partner, News X. So, ladies and gentlemen, let us begin our Business Line Agri and Commodity Summit 2024 with a thunderous round of applause once again. Now, I would like to call upon on the stage Mr. Rahubi Srinivasan, editor of Business Line, to kindly join us on the stage for the welcome address. Let's go there with a round of applause. It's, it's quite cold outside, I know, for someone who comes from a city where when temperature drops below 20, people pull out their sweaters and monkey caps. You know, this is extremely cold. So, uh, thank you for braving the cold and joining us all this morning here. Uh, Business Line is probably the only newspaper in the country which uh, focuses very sharply on agriculture and commodities. Uh, it is part of our DNA. I have been with the paper from the day it was founded 30 years ago. And uh, we decided back then that agriculture should be a prime focus area for the newspaper. Uh, the importance of agriculture can never be understated. Uh, you know, 20%, almost a fifth of India's GDP comes from agribusiness. And, uh, uh, you know, with 60% of our working population engaged in agriculture, uh, the business of agriculture, commodities, and the profession of agriculture can never be overemphasized. It is extremely important for our economy. And uh, this Indian agriculture is now at the crossroads with farmers having advanced technologies at their disposal while facing problems of climate change at the same time. Our food grain production in 22-23 was 330 million tons. It has increased nearly 30% in the past decade, 30%, a third in just 10 years. Rice production was a record 135 million tons in 22-23 and maize 36 million tons. But this year, the problems of climate change are really upon us. The Agriculture Ministry has estimated over 3% shortfall in Kharif production this year. The Rabi season is also facing problems with our major reservoirs, storage level dropping below 60% of capacity. We have had the second warmest year in 2023, with August being the driest in 120 years. That will tell you the kind of problem that we are up against. The southwest monsoon was deficient, with rainfall being only 94% of the long period average. South India is the one bearing the brunt of El Nino, which is currently on and will continue till June 2024. Storages in the peninsula region is below 40%. And the crop situation in Karnataka and Andhra Pradesh is really worrisome. Despite record production, we had imported edible oil, spending over 1.25 lakh crore. That's precious money. Our pulses import will be a six-year high of over 3 million tons. Various governments over the last couple of decades have been making efforts to increase oil seeds and pulses output. But rising population disposable income are making it tough for production to meet demand. The Supreme Court's recent plea to states such as Punjab to shift from cultivation of rice is a new challenge for agriculture in India. We are extremely excited uh, to see how the day unfolds. Now moving ahead, I would like to request on stage Mr. Vijay Paul Sharma, Chairman, Commission of Agricultural Cost and Prices, Ministry of Agriculture and Farmers' Welfare, Government of India to kindly join us for his special address. Ladies and gentlemen, let's welcome him with a round of applause. Uh, let me first uh, compliment the uh, business line for uh, taking this initiative and organizing this summit, uh, which is extremely important and uh, much sincere thanks to them for uh, providing me this opportunity to share some of my thoughts uh, uh, on the topic, uh, uh, you know, 
Agriculture is important uh, from various dimensions. Uh, for example, uh, you know that today most of the people are saying that agriculture uh, contributes uh, only 14 to 15 percent of uh, our GDP, so it has lost its relevance and importance. Uh, but I think we must keep in mind that uh, this sector supports livelihoods of uh, more than 60 percent, almost half of your workforce is uh, engaged in agriculture. So from the larger, you know, the socio-political perspective, I think if our 15%, 14-15% GDP does well, it takes care of large section of the society. So we must keep that thing in mind. And second is, uh, you know, there has been a dramatic uh, or paradigm shift in uh, our agriculture, all in our agriculture policy uh, for the last six, seven years. Uh, when Honorable Prime Minister shared his vision of doubling farmers' income in 2016, and I think there was a dramatic shift from, uh, you know, production-centric approach to, you know, focus on uh, farmers' welfare and income. So earlier we were uh, more happy when uh, we were setting certain targets and uh, achieving those targets, but uh, we were not really concerned so much about farmers' welfare and income. But I think uh, today the farmers' income and welfare has become, as, is at the center stage of our policy formulation and implementation. I start with a firm belief that we have a great future in agriculture. I mean, uh, what we need to drive, as the chairman said, is to drive optimum utilization of the farm assets we have, is number one. And farm assets include, of course, farm, the land, the water, the technology, the human capital. Uh, if we optimize it uh, with a commercial vision and sustainability, we can really make uh, uh, our Bharat, a Vixit Bharat maybe, in a couple of years. That's how uh, the bank's vision is also to be associated with the government vision and the holistic development of agriculture segment or agriculture sector. As rightly said earlier also, India is what its agriculture is. This is because agriculture has got a tremendous social impact, economic impact, growth impact even political impact. So we must understand that uh, this sector, which actually has almost 70% or less people, maybe 67%, my arithmetic may not be correct, engaged in agriculture directly or indirectly into allied sector. So this is one of the most important sector and that is why I said that India is what its agriculture is in a broader perspective. Policy support initiatives, one of the great support is agri infra fund and there are almost 40,000 units already done, but the policy support has not been utilized uh, by our, uh, I mean, the, the people which actually government wanted. And I'm happy to share that we, we hold 25% market share in the agri infra fund. We have just crossed 10,000 sanctions, 10,000 number sanctions in agri infra fund, whereas the country has somewhere around 39,000. But that is the way forward because when we actually get the policy support and we create units uh, of post-harvest management, we are actually preserving the food. And as I said, preserving the food is more important uh, or as important as producing. Government has given wonderful initiatives in, in last couple of years, like as it was said earlier also, Pradhan Mantri Sicha Yojana, Pradhan Mantri Matsya Sampada Yojana, a green infra fund, then we had AHIDF, uh, this scheme was operational but uh, likely to be rolled further. Then we have got one of the great schemes called PMFME, uh, Prime Minister's Micro I mean, Food Enterprises, which, which can happen all across the country. And it will again uh, go to a food chain. So the farmer can become part of value chain through those schemes. And the use of technology, which I said. And uh, let me tell you, SBA's contribution in this is that uh, there is a study uh, done by uh, perhaps Nabad or uh, I don't remember actually, but the study says the formal credit increase has got a direct impact to the GDP contribution of agriculture. So a 10% increase in the formal credit or institutional credit will yield uh, more than 1% of uh, contribution in the GDP of agriculture. Uh, agriculture, uh, which contributes to the GDP. Uh, 
we are working through collectives we are working across the country through our branches and we drive all the government initiatives and as a result let me tell you we are growing much much more than 10% a year and we we are proud to i mean uh, to be associated uh, in, in last couple of years with the kind of policy support initiative when the stress in agriculture is also coming down uh, because the farmers are also being more and more aware about their civil scores or the crif scores and the uh, all that and the digitalization has also taken place so uh, i will i will again go back to uh, my original statement india is what its agriculture is proud to be associated with uh, uh, hindu to be part of this event hello okay thank you so when we talk about this uh, millets i think uh, the first thing that should come to our mind is about uh, the climate resilience that they possess one, one is uh, the very nature of that it is a proven thing i think perhaps the data some studies done here and there but otherwise they are proven for going sustain in extreme weather conditions whether it is a heat tolerant nature or whether it is a climate resilience in terms of even the water requirement that they possess because if you talk about millets i think they require about 300 mm of water and they can sustain compared to rice and others 1200 to 2100 mm of water so even the cl- climate uh, w- what you call the carbon footprints because of the c4 pathway of a photosynthetic pathway that it adopts is a highly en- energy efficient uh, pathway that uh, these millets uh, are going to come to stay as because the footprints in today's context i think the governments and even the people are talking about talking about the carbon footprints Re- recently we had a meeting with uh, pepsico in fact uh, they have come to us uh, to collaborate with indian institute of millet research uh, primarily because these millets are uh, having the you know the car- carbon neutral thing so if the industry is thinking that way i think there is a great need for us to really just promote them and take things forward so what i would like to ask him is you know how has climate change really been impacting the sugar sector and you know are there any new avenues arising from the experience in the sugar sector that can help uh, in this and also combat emissions what he was talking about subramani thank you uh, for the question uh, first let me uh, congratulate hindu business line for for taking up this important issue uh, and this seems like a very appropriate time to be discussing climate change um, within the indian context within india's role uh, on the global stage as well as far as the sugar industry is concerned i'll i'll make three brief points the first point is the experience over the last 5 years Uh, the first four being la nina years so we had plentiful rainfall not just in north india but across the country in positively impacting the sugar sector the honorable prime minister's vision of doubling farmers income was taken up by the sugar industry and achieved probably before any other industry uh, statistically in in uttar pradesh we achieved the doubling of farmers income in 3 years and that was primarily because of some changes in agricultural practices new and better seed and varieties of sugar cane uh, and not not just not just pricing which is probably the simplest way of 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 increasing uh, of of increasing income of course all of this was supported by excellent weather uh, and that plays a crucial role uh, during a time period where we where we saw good rainfall and potentially higher temperatures it's important to mention that what we noticed was a advent of newer diseases or perhaps the same disease but at different points in times in the calendar year uh, impacting the crop and that is something that is going to become far more prevalent across agricultural food chains uh, as we see changes in 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 climate now you you pointed out to bramani that uh, since august we were facing uh, el nino and we're probably going to continue facing it uh all the way until the advent of uh the southwest monsoon uh, and let's hope that it ends at that particular point in time the consequence of that has been very hard felt by the nation as far as sugarcane is concerned so we've seen karnataka where yields and uh, and area has fallen um to a total of 35% potentially even 40% in certain districts 
that impact on farmers, that kind of change year and year, uh, leads to tremendous numbers of hardship. In Maharashtra, we've seen that uh, come to about 20 odd percent. Interestingly, in Uttar Pradesh, which was the start of your question, the impact has not been has not been negative. In fact, by moderated, because Uttar Pradesh has the benefit, or when I speak of Uttar Pradesh or and I speak of North India, we, we have the great luxury of canal irrigation for large portions of the northern part of our nation. Uh, as a result, with moderated rainfall, you actually manage to get good yields. You actually manage to get higher levels of productivity. And we've seen that this year. So you've seen uh, a, a kind of a perverse result uh, to this uh, El Nino condition, uh, at least thus far. I'm not saying that that is what will happen if this persists. In fact, uh, you know, it is, there is, there are limitations, of course, uh, to irrigation. There are limitations, of course, to um, harsh weather conditions, etc. But the lessons that we've learned coming, arising out of the sugar industry and its impact on climate change is, is absolutely essential. Uh, the chairman of CACP spoke about the advent of the eth ethanol ecosystem. Now, that's, that's extremely important. The impact on our nation uh, cannot, uh, I, I cannot stress the positive impact more. Minister Hardeep Puri, day before yesterday, made a public statement that last year, India saved 24,300 crores of foreign exchange because of the ethanol that was domestically produced. And that enormous sum of money went directly into the bank accounts of farmers very, very quickly. So, you know, the, the creation of ecosystems, the creation of sunrise industries, and first generation ethanol being one of them, has been a huge contributor coming out of the sugar sector, migrating towards becoming an energy sector uh, in, in terms of helping to combat climate change. As we move forward, and I won't take up too much more time, and uh, perhaps I can talk about it a little bit later, there are many other sectors that will offer second and third generation technologies as India moves up and perhaps becomes a leader, a global leader, in terms of embracing new technologies of second and third generation bio products. Um, but the experience in the sugar sector has been uh, of course, when we look at the nation, has been mixed. But climate change will play a role. I think it's important for us to be able to marry three things. One, sustainable policy framework. I think that is very, very important. Education for our sugar farmers across the nation in terms of what is required, not just today, but also for tomorrow. And lastly, an investment by industry and a commitment by industry to invest not just in partnering with farmers, but also in enhancing efficiencies of existing infrastructure. Thank you. Well, well, very well enunciated, Mr. Sawney. Now, uh, I would ask Dr. Singh, because he interacts through his Asalwa uh, Fasal app with many farmers. So I would request him to tell us what really have farmers been telling him over the last couple of years, because he directly interacts with farmers. So. Over to Dr. Singh. Uh, thank you very much, uh, uh, Subhu, and uh, thank you, Hindu Business Line, for having invited me to speak here. Uh, I've been following Hindu Business Line as a trader for the last 30 years. I was in commodity trade, so I know what it means to have a knowledge and information on the markets, particularly. Now, uh, we got into uh, talking about the climate change. Uh, uh, the climate change is uh, uh, predictable to some extent. Weather forecast is one thing that we have been involved in uh, when uh, we started uh, working with the India Med Department. We did a lot of projects for them. And uh, one of the projects which I personally as a agricultural student was of was fascinating to me was we created a pilot briefing system for Indian Air Force through IMD. You know, when they fly at what height they must go and what kind of weather they will have. Then I started thinking that if I am a, 
a, a farmer, I am an agricultural student, why don't we apply the same to the farmer? So we created, uh, we tried to create a, some kind of a uh, application which the farmer gets specifically for his crop, for his uh, area where he is located, for his soil and his variety. So uh, we were able to, it took us nearly five years to granulate all the data. And we were able to generate, uh, since we were generating weather forecasts already, I mean, we uh, uh, as uh, aggregator and SkyMet, we generate weather forecasts for each village 10 days every day. So this forecast is available uh, to the farmers. There is an app that we have uh, developed called Fasal Salah. It's freely downloadable, downloadable. You can download them. Now, what it does is, if the farmer is, let's say, in indoor, <coughs> and he's uh, growing soybean, uh, from date of sowing till the maturity, he gets all the information which is required for his variety in his field every day till the harvest, uh, actually till post-harvest. So, and the same thing about the major crops that we have done, because it is a, the, putting the agronomy and weather science together is highly complicated. So that's what we have done. And we are able to, so far we are linked with about 350,000 farmers. We are advising them on an individual basis. And one of the things which they need and which we are able to provide and which is a saleable product is the market information. You'll be surprised to know that the farmers today are much better educated. They have got everything in their cell phone and uh, they want to know what is happening in Ukraine, whether the wheat prices will, uh, will stay where they are, whether they should hold it, they should sell it. So these are the things uh, uh, which we have learned and which we would like to, uh, you know, the uh, audience here to know. So I, I say here, uh uh, it's a smart person. Why? It's a reg resilient agriculture we are talking. Uh, say, for example, there is a stress of uh, submergency of flood. We were recommending flood tolerance. So similarly, in case of uh, temperature, yeah, in case of drought. But this is the time we don't know. The climate, the variation is such that there may be when we don't need rain, there is rain. When we need rain, there is no rain, there is drought, severe droughts, unpredictable. So to all these things like biotic stresses are sometimes sudden and uh, some uh, e uh, few years back, you know, the brown front hopper suddenly appeared in the month of October and it was uh, devastating. So uh, what I want to say that all the stresses are coming simultaneously and uh, we are, farmers are unable to predict sometimes. Uh, the first one is, of course, the climate change, which the panel before me, uh, before this panel, they had a very deep discussion, deep diving discussion on that topic. And because that is very critical, because that will ensure the supply of goods even when the, you know, even when, even if there is a climate change. So that is point number one. Uh, if I talk about the second point, which is the infrastructure part, uh, it is again very critical because uh, one of the speaker talked about the losses that we incurred in post harvest which is uh, the number he quoted was around one uh, i think more than one, around a trillion rupees so which is again very important to provide the right infrastructure because if you had the produce and you are not able to provide the right infrastructure i think that is a very big issue so what is your wastage level in online and whether online platform has been able to reduce that wastage to what extent please throw some light sure um, thank you prabhuji ji for uh, you know, inviting me here. Uh, let me just give you a quick brief about what we do. So I'm Varun, I run a startup called OTP. It's in the fruits and vegetable supply chain business. So broadly, through an app, uh, consumers place orders with us. Uh, the USP of the platform is being able to move produce in as little as 12 hours from farm to home. And this gives a lot of leverage from a consumer standpoint because the produce consumers get is much, much fresher, which otherwise would have stopped at various hops in the supply chain. And um, the second big advantage of that is that, you know, we are able to minimize the wastages also to a big degree because uh, 
See, if you think about it, you know, wastages happen when produce is sitting at a point and there is no one to pick it up from there. Uh, uh, if, I mean, uh, in last, uh, so far, you know, all the value has been added away from the farm. So, farmer share in retail value or whatever consumer pays has remained limited to 15 to 25 percent. So, as per, you know, our understanding and studies, we feel we can add around 5 to 10 percent efficiencies in terms of net realization to farmers on input side, around 10 to 15 percent efficiencies on the output side. So farmers, you know, share in uh, consumer or, you know, value generated ideally should be, you know, 25 to 35 percent, which is not existing right. Yet another uh, exciting session planned for all of you. It is an issue which is uh, underplayed in the agriculture sector and the issue is the role of women. Why is it that uh, despite evidence uh, and documentation that agriculture is now a feminized uh, sector. We have, uh, we have women who are completely invisible. We, uh, why, is it that, uh, why is it so that, uh, that uh, women's contribution to agriculture is so invisible? So well, uh, thank you Poonima for this question. And I would like to answer this question with an insightful, I'll ask the audience to close your eyes for one minute. One second, because we don't have more time. Imagine a farmer and be true to yourself. Whom do you imagine? You imagine a man with a turban. The vocabulary we use as a stakeholder of agriculture system, we always use he, not she. So that's the intensity of this issue. Imagine, as you very well quoted, 80% of the agriculture work is being done by women in India. If I talk globally, it's about 36% of women active participation is there in agriculture of women and men have 2% more, which is 38%. So you can see they have an equal level playing field, uh, you know, in, as far as agriculture is concerned. In India, if you see, you go on a farm, we all are, uh, you know, agriculture stakeholders sitting here, whether we are from government, from public sector, private sector, or even from research institute, you have immense role of women in every agri-food system, every stages of agri-food system. But then also they're ignored, they're invisible. And uh, let me also talk about some of the positive aspects because I'm a very optimistic person when it comes to women farmers. Unheard are being heard. And that's why we have this session right now. The question is, how do we make it a mo movement? In India, if you see the self-help group which has come up, has played a tremendous role, if you ask from my experience of last one decade, and also with the data, they have played an important role for mainstreaming women in different sectors. Specifically, when we see about agriculture, the women are being mainstreamed. The question is, it's about our social perception, our own thinking pattern, which is at the root of this cause of invisibility of women in agriculture. Uh, in terms of increasing, not just increasing productivity, but also gaining more and more empowerment and ownership of their, uh, their produce and becoming visible as it were. Thanks, Purnima. Uh, from a technology point of view and specifically from how does one enable women smallhold farmers to access and uptake that technology. And I think the starting point really among all of us in this room and outside as well is a change in mindset. Smallhold farmers, if we are to actually enable them to contribute to our GDP and actually get that 1% increase in GDP by a 10% increase in, uh, uh, in financing support, say, to agriculture, as was mentioned by the SBI this morning. Uh, we need to look at smallhold farmers, specifically women as well, as entrepreneurs. And all entrepreneurs require some sort of a kickstart support. We've seen a uh, growing instance of how uh, in small holdings, uh, while the men go out and migrate, it's the women who are, who are literally managing the farm, doing everything. And your experience, Avijit, uh, with, uh, with small farmers at the grassroots, and uh, despite the absence of line titles, etc., is sort of engagement with the self-help groups or FPOs, is it 
helping women access uh, sort of uh, government schemes and programs and so on. What has been your experience and how much to what extent uh, SHGs and FPOs are helping uh, women farmers, individual farmers? Of, uh, how do you see the things, you know, changing? Uh, I think one important data that uh, Purnima was mentioning is that though 80% are uh, in, into farming, only 13% have land titles in their names. And that incidentally is actually the biggest block. Because you see, the policies, though they espouse, you know, involvement of women, they are mostly gender neutral. They do not recognize the special needs of women. And because the land titles are not in their names, they do not have access to the schemes uh, or to credit or to uh, many other such enabling conditions which they would require otherwise. Now, in our work, what we have seen, and uh, this is a journey for us and also for the women that we work with, this two million women. Uh, some ten years back, what we used to see is that uh, we used to have what you call the SHGs, the self help groups. And then we used to have a meeting and discuss, you know, what is the cropping choices, what is the cropping plan. And the Didis, as you call them, the Didis, they would say, Haan, bhaiya, bohat achha hai, isko karna chahiye. And they would say, Ki, Theek hai, bhaiya, next meeting mein hum log, uh, will tell you. Uh, hum kitna mein karenge. Because anyway, these lands are fragmented, handkerchief sized plots of land scattered across the landscape. Uh, uh, upland mein hai, koi middle land mein hai. So these lands also require different kinds of crops. But next week, when they come back to the SSG meeting and they say, Ki, uh, nahi bhaiya, nahi karna hai. Nah, kyun nahi karna hai? Because, you know, mana kar diya hai. Dada ne mana kar diya hai. So you see, what happens is that, but we then ask them, but Dada to chale jayenge, do hafte baad. Wo to Bangalore chale jayenge, to kheti to aapko karna hai. So then we realized, you see, the problem is with the mindset. The women themselves do not see themselves as farmers. So when you ask them, then meeting me ki, acha haath uthaiye, kaun kaun kisa nahi hai aapke? Nobody would raise their hands. Welcome, Business Lines Editor, Mr. Raghuveer Srinivasan, for a fireside chat with Amul Managing Director, Mr. Jain Mehta, on Amul's aspirations and pathway for the future. Let us welcome them with a round of applause, ladies and gentlemen. Now, what is exactly the game plan that you're working on for Amul, a long-term game plan, say, in the next five, ten years? Where do you want to see Amul? What what businesses would you want it to be in? Uh, first of all, thank you so much for having me here. And let me also confide with all of you that he has not shared the questions with me. <laughs> so as I, when I came in, I asked him, sir, could paper leak karo? He says, no, it will be all <laughs> there impromptu. So, but before we start and I answer his question or try to answer his question, let me talk about the session timing. And you are reminded of a professor, I'm reminded of a consultant who once told me, that there are three most difficult things in life to do. One is to kiss a girl who is leaning against you, going on the other direction. The second is to climb a wall which is leaning towards you. And the third is to have a session at such a time post lunch. <laughs> so since I have not experience of the first two, <laughs> and the third one is now being imposed upon me, <laughs> so we try to make the best out of uh, this time and hopefully keep you engaged till the coffee break. Uh, <clears throat> sir, as you told, Amul is uh, having a turnover of about 72,000 crores and uh, growing at a fast pace. Uh, the credit goes to the, the cooperative model and the 36 lakh farmers who are associated with it and for the last 77 years, they have come to this path and a trajectory in which we are very, very optimistic about how the future is shaping up for us, both first for the dairy industry as a whole, second for the food industry as a whole and the FMCG business that we are in and the opportunities we surround them both in the space of cooperatives and in the space of business right as a consumer facing business. Uh, milk has been the core part of our business and the journey of milk dairy industry growth in India also can be attributed to this Amul cooperative model because India at the time of independence had very little production of milk. We were dependent on imports. The quality was not very good. Amul started to prevent the exploitation by the private traders and private companies with inspiration of Sadar Vallabhbhai Patel, two village societies, 247 liters of milk, to about 360 lakh liters of milk that we are handling today. Average will be more than 300 lakh liters per day, uh, nine, 10 million metric tons, which is the eighth largest corporate in the world. And more importantly, this helped India become the largest producer of milk in the world. And as a byproduct, milk also is now the largest agricultural crop of India. An opportunity came uh, in the space of organics. 
I mean, there was no other reason for us to get into the atta, dal, chawal, sugar and all what you mentioned. But the organic space gave us this opportunity that if people want food without chemical fertilizers and pesticides, and farmers are also interested in protecting the soil because of otherwise rampant use of chemical fertilizers and pesticides, the quality of carbon content, the quality of productivity of the soil has gone down. How do we as a brand come in as a bridge between a producer who is growing organic to a consumer who wants to eat food without chemical fertilizer and pesticides? So that's how we forward into that particular space. And anything what we do, I mean, we also got into the space of frozen po uh, the potato based snacks or the french fries and so on, or even honey, apart from what the normal dairy products that we are doing. But this is, this is what is becoming a very uh, good opportunity for us to leverage our farmer association with our consumer association, be the bridge between the both. Amul stands for trust, Amul stands for quality, Amul stands for value for money. So these are the attributes which has been built over the last seven decades and this is the time we realize as an organization with a nationwide distribution network, exports to more than 50 countries, that we can actually be a formidable force in all the food and FMCG space that we can operate. So, uh, <clears throat> in the recent uh, few, uh, few months ago, you launched a protein-rich buttermilk <clears throat> and other protein-rich products. So, what is the thinking behind launching something like that and uh, how have the success of these products been? How has the market accepted them? Uh, protein is a very important part of our, I mean, uh, we, we need to be consuming one gram of protein per kg of body weight every day. But most of us, if we are vegetarians, it is difficult to achieve that number of 50, 60, 70 grams and so on. Uh, we are the largest manufacturer of cheese and paneer and we have the largest quantity of whey available. And because we didn't have a product of a protein which was to be extracted out of this way, we had to pay to throw away the whey. Uh, but I remember 20 years back in a conference which I attended somewhere in Athens, a scientist told that today when we make cheese out of milk, we eat the cheese and throw away the whey. A day will come when you will throw away the cheese and use the way. In the next session, we will discuss about the role of fintech in easing credit access to farmers. And we have a very eminent set of panelists to discuss the fintech topic with all of us. And I would like to invite Mr. K. R. Srivats to moderate this session for us. Please welcome him with a round of applause, ladies and gentlemen. Start with Mr. Mani Kumar. And I would request him to do a deep dive on 2023 and also do some crystal ball gazing for 2024. Thank you, Mr. Srivats. Uh, uh, good evening, everybody. And I think it's not too late to wish all of you a very, very happy new year. And uh, thanks to Business Line for uh, having me on the panel. Uh, as you said, when we look back at 2023, I will look at it as an year of corrections. You know, post-COVID or during COVID, we saw a lot of traction in the agri-tech and the agri-fintech space. Uh, we had many of the agri-tech companies enabling farmers to reach the consumers directly. And, uh, you know, there was a, uh, you know, um, a, a, an overload of funding going into the sector. But then uh, what happened was the, the fintechs, the agri-techs, uh, and uh, started experimenting, uh, went big on experimentation and, uh, and a stage came where valuations were running way ahead of fundamentals. Reality set in and now in 2023 we saw a considerable slowdown in uh, investor interest in terms of funding. You know, While they were showing intent in words, they were very, very cagey when it came to opening the purse strings. What do you think are going to be the defining moments for 2024? And before that, please go back in time, look at 2023 and what according to you was where some of the uh, big transformative changes that one saw in the agri-financing space. Thank you and it's wonderful to be here post-lunch as the previous fireside chat has actually put on a fire <laughs> to the entire, uh, entire gathering here. Wonderful to be here and thankful to the business line and the Hindu group uh, uh, for inviting Samunati and me here. One way of looking at last year and how it is going to be is the statistical way of looking at it and Mr. Manikumar has beautifully shared so many directional things that have happened and that are likely to happen. As an entrepreneur, I would look at it 
from a directional perspective, what are those changes that we have seen directionally in terms of how the fintech in relation to agriculture, because that is the area that, that, that I uh, know a little bit, uh, fintech not as a broad area. So I'll confine my, my, my uh, uh, inputs and understanding and uh, sharing to fintech in uh, agriculture. So what are those directional things that we saw and we would likely to see? For me, before I lose uh, Mr. Mehta, if his time is, is uh, uh, precious, the journey of fintech in agriculture, or tech in agriculture, is the journey between one AI and the other AI. Right? One AI is artificial insemination. And, and we see many of our farmers taking care of the parrots as if they are the messiahs of them, because they know when a parrot comes, the artificial insemination, you impregnate the cow, the cow gives calf and then milk and then you have money and they don't mind paying for that AI. The moment you say, I am running an AI where connecting to a satellite and then I will look at it, your, you know, look at your uh, field and I will tell you what is growing and for that I am going to charge, they will say, I know what is happening in my field even before you connect to satellite. So paying for that AI is something that they don't relate to. So, uh, Mr. Rajiv, tell us how was 2023 uh, as regards uh, agri-fintechs and uh, what's in store for 2024 uh, and uh, what are the new areas that SBI is looking at? We want you to be a bit more frank. Give us or share with us what's on the drawing board. So thank you so much and good afternoon everyone. Uh, I think my, uh, uh, I mean, as I see Agritech is uh, not a separate ent entity, but Agritech, uh, how I understand is the use of technology in agriculture to uh, improve the e efficiency, yield output of the uh, productions. So uh, that is how, I mean, uh, if I talk about the, uh, how the year 2023 has been for Agritech. I think my response will be a mix of both. Uh, yes, it has been a challenging year for uh, agri-tech entrepreneurs. So there have been challenges, uh, but they have shown uh, great resilience also. They have uh, been, uh, I mean, they have stayed in the market and uh, we have just uh, heard the numbers also from both uh, my uh, fellow speakers. I would say 2023 year uh, was also the year of uh, collaborations and uh, coordination. If I talk about the uh, bank only, SBA only, so uh, my CGM was also speaking in the morning and uh, right now also it was shared by uh, both of you. We have actually uh, engaged with the, many of these agri-techs uh, to make them at the, uh, to, to bring them at the front end of our services. The next panel discussion on our very crucial topic, food security. And which are the areas where you think problems are going to rise? going forward. See, when we say food security is a concern uh, with the growing population and the kind of uh, uh, consumption pattern is also increasing in India. Despite that, uh, uh, we were importing a lot of wheat, we were impo uh, still we are importing a lot of pulses, we have been importing edible oils also. But curbing wheat export was a major cause of, was because of the Ukraine and Russia war. We were exporting around 7 million ton. Suddenly the production number has decreased from uh, 114, it was somewhere around 203. But rice, we, were, uh, we, were, we are still the top post exporter globally. We are doing, uh, we were doing 46% uh, of the global share. But today again, despite the ban, we are the number one today. Okay. The consumption of rice has been moderately increased in the African nations and because of this uh, special cases despite the ban, uh, government of India has allowed around 2.2 million tons of white rice and 100% brokens to the vulnerable countries and uh, the neighboring countries also. <coughs> Sugar, we are, uh, we have to uh, suddenly put a ban because the reason was very simple that the exports number were so high and the ethanol consumption, ethanol conversions also started through molasses. So the production was getting diverse. 
so that was a call which i think uh, safety first was a uh, uh, major reason that the government has taken that call and that was the reason that he, all these major uh, uh, food commodities were taken into the restrictions or a ban or you can say for the time being it was controlled okay uh, coming to dr yadav uh, dr yadav you know uh, what what roles uh, do you think the cooperatives can play you know in ensuring food security you know? Uh, thank you so much for giving me this opportunity to be here on this forum. Uh, the question is the role of cooperatives in ensuring food security. So I would like to inform that the cooperatives uh, have always been playing a big role in ensuring the food security. Uh, but when you see the value chain, we see that cooperatives have been engaged in production and procurement primarily. All the buffer stock that we have been maintaining, the procurements, have been taken by the primary uh, agriculture cooperative societies by doing the procurement process with ease. But now what we see is that as the food security is becoming more complex and the consumption patterns are changing, we also see the cooperatives now taking a leap forward in building the assets, the infrastructure. Uh, the, the session prior to this was talking about the AIF and creation of the farm uh, located uh, infrastructure which are of low capex and we see that the that there's a scheme coming up, the world's uh, largest food grain uh, infrastructure, which is going to be a convergence scheme of the eight schemes of Government of India. Now, this scheme is going to talk about, you know, the, the warehouse at the farm locations, which are going to be managed by the cooperative society. I mean, this is, this is a very transformational thing, where we, are, where we have something like 329 million tons of food grain coming up. We are falling short of the warehouses. And more and more warehouses are located near the market or in the market APMCs. But here there's a locational change here. We see warehouses coming at the farm. There'll be two advantages. Number one, that the post-harvest wastes that take place in the food grain would be kind of minimized to a lot of extent. And second thing, the farmers would have some decision ability because the, the food grain has been stored in the farm, at the farm. So it takes the decision abilities of the, the packs to be more improved. I'll just add on to this, and now there has also been a remarkable change where we see that uh, we are talking about you know, PAX to APEX. By APEX, we mean to say we have three national bodies which are going to take care of the end-to-end -end value chain. So if there are cooperative societies and FPOs who have the capability to export but have some kind of barriers, then we have this kind of a national body of cooperative uh, export limited which has been kind of instrumental in exporting the rice to the other countries. So we see more and more of uh, interventions of the aggregated models like cooperatives who are going to shoulder the food security of this country. Thank you. Okay, thank you. I'll, I'll come back to you later on that point. So, Mr. Kaushik, uh, so what, what, how do you see the issue of food security now and uh, you see any areas where the government need to proactively take some measures? Uh, see, uh, food security to be looked into two, uh, through two lenses. One is the, the statutory lens, which is uh, the guarantee of food to each and every citizen. Uh, the second lens is a more holistic, which is part of the uh, SDG uh, obligations uh, as a signatory to the UN sustainability uh, commitment, is that nutrition security. Because if we want India to be a developed country, not only in terms of physical infrastructure, but also in terms of people infrastructure, we need to provide nutrition security to this 1.4 plus billion population for at least one generation before we improve the overall physical and uh, uh, what you call uh, mental uh, health, uh, mental uh, capacities of the entire population. Uh, there has been uh, enough studies globally which has uh, established that sustained intergenerational nutrition deficiency has resulted into impairment of the physical and mental faculties of the whole uh, societies and that is reflective in the comparative chart of uh, uh, IQs of various countries where those countries which have seen uh, sufficient support to the communities in nutrition uh, safety, their IQ levels are pretty reasonable as compared to countries which have denied or not been able to provide sufficient nutrition uh, security along with the food security. So that's a larger term goal for uh, the, the uh, uh, government as well as uh, the public participants also that we ensure uh, through public uh, pu uh, private partnership that India attains both food security and nutrition security for a bright future for the public as a large. 
Now coming to the uh, uh, immediate address of the quantity of food that India produces, that today we are producing close to around 1.1 billion tons of biomass between uh, row crops, uh, sugar cane and uh, horticulture, between three of them. And I am not including the forest produce because that's one area. China has approximately 108 billion net zone area and around 166 gross zone area, managed by around 200 uh, million farmer households. And they produce $1.37 trillion of the agriculture produce, excluding dairy and meat. And uh, <clears throat> Mr. Ranjit, you, uh, Ranjit comes from an interesting uh, background. He is a techie, basically, a niche techie player who comes to uh, life, uh, livestock to solve the problems of li livestock sector. He is now, the, the, the startup is focusing on dairy sector. It is developing end-to-end -end, uh, solutions for the dairy sector. I will uh, ask uh, Mr. Ranjit, Mr. Ranjit, you tell us what kind of opportunities that technology can do to a particular sector in livestock. Uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Kurpat, uh, for having me here. Uh, good evening, everyone. Um, as uh, Dr. Kurmet said, uh, we call ourselves as the digital, uh, you know, dairy uh, in a fairly large sector. So, uh, from a technology perspective, what we have attempted to do uh, is to use uh, technology to solve for productivity, quality, and traceability. We call it as PQT. That, that's the three pillars that we try to solve for. Um, I think all the speakers have spoken about. Okay. This, uh, productivity is very poor, the farm throughput is very poor. That's also true of dairy, right? Be it in, num in terms of uh, number of cattle per farmer, be it in terms of productivity, be it in terms of yield per animal, be it in terms of animal genetics. Um, there's a lot of room for improvement. So one part of uh, uh, tech is about on the farm side using things like farm management technologies, herd management technologies, genetic improvements. How do you improve uh, farm throughput? better breeding, um, you know, better animal health uh, upkeep, like vaccination, deworming, and all of that. So that's one part. Right? The other part is all the data that we get from the farm. How do we enable that to provide more ancillary services to the farmers? Um, a good percentage, we had a fintech panel where multiple people spoke, uh, more than 60% of our farmers are new to credit. How do you underwrite credit risk for these farmers? How do you underwrite insurance risk for these farmers? So we use a lot of uh, alternate data that the technology pulls out uh, to help underwrite some of these risks, right? And two, from a supply chain perspective, a lot of uh, tech that gets deployed. Um, grading and pricing, how do you do automated grading and pricing so that it's not based on a subjective self-reporting audits. Tech should tell what's the grade and what's the price. Farming in water has, uh, has uh, taken place. So uh, nowadays uh, it's more than you know 1.6 actually 12 million tons is from uh, farming. Okay. okay. So this farming uh, again generate uh, food and only thing is that uh, how this uh, new because in the in the recent era you have seen that any any future trajectory growth is driven by technology. So this, uh, this industry is very nascent, it started picking up and it has absorbed a very, uh, very, in, a very recent technologies and that's a short result that I will mention about my second. Uh, uh. Thank you, Mr. Vijayan. For our next session, which is a valedictory address, and we have a very special guest. I would like to invite on the dais, Dr. Ajay Kumar Sood, Deputy Managing Director, Nabar to please join us on the stage for his valedictory address. Uh, around 34% of the fruits and around 44% uh, of the vegetables, they are wasted post-harvest. So I think uh, the major factor that worsens these losses is the fragmentation of agricultural uh, land holdings into smaller parcels with the elaborate post-harvest value chain less accessible to the uh, larger numbers. So agricultural uh, waste management poses a major challenge as crop residues burning in northern states increase the air pollution levels, create health hazards, and contribute to global warming. So there is an urgent need uh, to upgrade food quality and safety standards of, uh, of agricultural produce. Indian agricultural exports are 
still unable to penetrate into the markets of US and EU due to their higher sanitary and phytosanitary measures in these regions resulting in high refusal rates. Uh, I have already spoken of food security and uh, livestock, but uh, since there, there is a shift in the consumption pattern, now uh, the per capita consumption of uh, food grain, particularly cereals, is declining considerably while the demand for high uh, valued commodities like fruits and vegetables is rising. So for increasing the uh, supply of high value commodities in accordance with the increasing demand, as well as to manage the um, surplus of other commodities, there is a need for huge investment in market infrastructure, processing and storage facilities such as warehouses, cold storages, cold chain, etc. to build an efficient and reliable value chain. In this regard, I would uh, like to inform, as uh, you may be aware also, that NABAD has been helping in uh, all these aspects uh, in terms of different funds, like uh, we have RIDF, Rural Infrastructure Development Fund, we have Food Processing Fund, we have Warehouse Infrastructure Fund. So uh, through these funds, uh, we have uh, been helping in uh, infrastructure development in these areas. To sum the whole conference up, to sum the whole summit up, I would now like to invite Mr. Vinay Kamal of Business Line to please join us on the stage to give away the vote of thanks. Can we have a round of applause one more time, ladies and gentlemen? Yeah, uh, I'll just keep this short and sweet because it's been a long day. Uh, so thank you all for attending today's Business Line Agri and Commodity Summit 2024, you know, braving the cold. Uh, reports say that uh, the past few days have been some of the coldest Delhi has seen this season. Uh, thank you to Dr. Ajay Kumar Sood for having made the trip from uh, Bombay and rushing to the venue to be on time to deliver his valedictory address. So thank you sir, for that. Uh, we had uh, the CACP chairman, Mr. Vijay Paul Sharma, uh, set the tone for the summit by giving an excellent and broad overview of uh, the agriculture sector and the issues confronting the sector, which kind of set the tone for the discussions uh, later in the day. Uh, Mr. Sharma had made the very relevant point, which uh, again Subramani asked of Mr. Ajay Kumar Sood, that uh, private sector investment in the farm sector needs to grow up in exponentially for the sector to grow. and. Uh, then we had a, a panel discussing the important issue of climate change. The panel made the important point of uh, uh, saving 24,300 crore in foreign exchange because of uh, the use of ethanol. And uh, then we had other panels on building supply chain, resilient supply chains. We had the role of women in agriculture and on, on food security and tapping the potential of the livestock sector, which was the last session of the day. Uh, the highlight of the uh, afternoon was an informative and illuminating session with uh, the Amul MD, uh, Mr. Jayant Mehta, which uh, those who of you were present, so it was a session marked with uh, humor and a lot of anecdote as well, and it was very informative. Uh, I would like to thank all the sponsors who made this event possible. Uh, thank you to SPI for, uh, uh, for presenting this event and of course to NABAD and also uh, other associate sponsors, NCDX and Indofil Industries and uh, Danuka Agrotech and Cripco and uh, our regional partners were Vamicom and NSC and uh, our TV partner was uh, NewsX. Uh, so I would like to conclude by thanking you all for staying on for this last session and uh, have a nice evening. For more such videos, subscribe to the NewsX YouTube channel, hit the bell icon.